When my brother David laughed, he laughed with his whole body. And when I looked behind me, there he was laughing. I'd fallen for the 10th time. My brother David taught me how to ride a bike. I was seven years old. David took me out to a side dirt road that paralleled my grandmother's house. He would hold the bike and make me mount it like a horse. Left foot on the left pedal with a nice push off on the right over the seat and onto the pedal on the other side. This was the only way I could respectfully start to ride a bike. And this was practiced fall after fall over and over again. Now, the theory behind this was that once I was on the bike, I could use the momentum from the push off to just start pedaling. And then it was just a matter of balance. And one time that summer, I finally got it right. David was running alongside of me and I was balancing and keep, keeping balance and pedaling. I was so excited, I screamed, do you have me, do you have me? Yeah, he said, I have you. And as the ride got smoother and smoother, I looked behind me. David was way back there, waving with that big bright smile, Einstein eyebrows and wild curly hair, the distance between us getting bigger and bigger. And then I fell and he <laughs> laughed for the 11th time. David was one of two brothers I had. I lived in LA with my mom and my aunt. And as the story goes, my mom was afraid that the gangs would initiate my brother. So she shipped them off to live in Texas. And I only got to see them during summer breaks and Christmas holidays. But when they came to LA, things could get a little tricky. They would hold me hostage. <laughs> One of them would tie me to a chair while David would <laughs> maniacally cut the neck of my toy doll with a butcher <laughs> knife. But the joke was on them because my toy doll was made of solid plastic. <laughs> or they would make me sit on eggs for hours on my bean bag so that I could hatch them. <laughs> While they flew around me like pterodactyls protecting their unborn young. I couldn't even pee. And they just thought his, this was hysterical. But we, we did have some fun. In Texas, uh, they would put up aluminum cans on a fence and we would shoot them off with our BB gun rifles. Now, David said it was important to shoot them near the top so to ensure that they would go flying off just like in a Western movie. David was precise, determined, and smart. He made an elevator out of a milk he tied a rope to either end of the crate and threw it over a tree in such a way that he used it as a pulley to take us <coughs> to our little oasis. But with David, there was always some sort of mischief. We were playing in a pasture one day and he threw a horny toad on me. Now, if you don't know what a horny toad is, it looks like a small dinosaur. Mm -hmm. I ran running back to my grandmother's house with this thing clinging to my back. And David just thought this was hysterical. He barreled over with laughter with that, you know, his big bright smile, Einstein eyebrows and wild curly hair. David's laugh was infectious, loud, and continual and most always associated with some prank and almost always associated with me. <laughs> and when he smiled, he really, you know, he, 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 I just saw the, this big white teeth. It was just so brilliant. It's odd because I have a picture of David at 13 and his face is long and drawn. And he looks so sad. And you've seen this face before. It was the end of summer, 1981, and I was heading back to LA, leaving my brothers in Texas safe from gangs, but in the hands of my alcoholic grandfather and my sometimes angry grandmother. 
And I was sitting in the train looking at my brothers from the window, one looking stoic and David looking sad. And as the train pulled away from the station, David broke free from my grandmother's grip, reaching, pleading, tears streaming down from his face. Mom, please don't leave me. I stood up and put my hands on the glass as David continued to run towards the train, the distance between us getting bigger and bigger until David ran out of platform and was no longer in view. I'm eight years old and I'm playing on my lawn back in LA with my friend Linda. I loved Linda. She was blonde and pretty and her grandfather was an original munchkin from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> And from my house, I heard the most guttural, gut-wrenching screams coming from my mother. She was screaming in Spanish about David. Linda asked me, what was the matter? He died, I said. My brother is died. Oh, Linda said. David was precise, determined, and smart. David hung himself with a horse belt in the doorframe of a bathroom he shared with my grandfather. I really didn't know what happened. On the weekends, I asked my mom, let's call David. And she would say, David's not there. Oh, I said. Three years after he died, I had this dream. David and I were on this giant pterodactyl, smiling, flying high above Hollywood. And we landed a block down my house on Orange Drive. We walked down to the end of the block and I crossed the street and noticed that David wasn't there. I turned around and saw him on the curb. Come on, let's go home, I said. I can't, he said. Why not? I said. I just can't. You have to go on. I'll always be there. I put my head down and walked towards my home and the distance between us getting bigger and bigger. And I turned around to see him, but David was gone. One summer in Texas, when I was seven, my brother David taught me how to ride a bike. And when I looked behind me, I saw that boy with the big bright smile, Einstein eyebrows, and wild curly hair. David taught me what it was to be free, how to revel in my own uniqueness, how to be intelligent, inventive, savvy, and smart. And he has always been there with me. I just wished he had found a different way. Thank you.